Hi, we're going to start chapter 15. Ooh, applications of aqueous equilibrium. So you'll notice two things right away in this chapter when you look at it. The first is it's just what we learned the concept from chapter 13, the concept of chemical equilibrium. A lot of the applications are going to be of acid base chemistry. So you'll also see a lot of your chapter 14 in um, this chapter. So So um, you should find it interesting, no matter what you're taking a chemistry class for, this is very, they'll have a lot of examples from everything from dentistry to ecology, things like acid rain, how that impacts solubility, um, how fluoride helps your teeth, um, just all sorts of applications to geology, environmental science, biology, so hopefully you'll find something in here that's of uh, interest to what you want to study. So chapter 16 in the new edition is chapter 15 in your text. And so the first thing we're going to think about is how do acids and bases neutralize each other? So this is an example of a strong acid, strong base neutralization reaction. So HCl is a strong acid. NaOH is a strong base. So if you look at the difference between the first reaction and the second, the difference is that they've changed it to net ionic. So when HCl is in water, if it's a strong acid, it's completely dissociated to make H3O plus and Cl minus. And if sodium hydroxide is a strong base, the same thing is true there. The Na plus cations separate from the OH minus. And so really what the reaction is, is it's the hydronium cation formed as a result of HCl dissolving with the OH minus formed as a result of sodium hydroxide dissolving, both reacting with each other to make water. So to neutralize the acid and the base properties that we had. So when you add equal quantities of a strong acid and a strong base, the pH should be seven. So if you look at this, it's um, just pure water. A weak acid can be um, neutralized by a strong base. And when you look at writing the net ionic equation for that, this weak acid, which is acetic acid, is kept together because a weak acid doesn't completely dissociate. The strong base sodium hydroxide does. So we can separate the sodium cation from the hydroxide. And so the net reaction is the weak acid reacting with the strong base to make water, and then the conjugate base of the weak acid. So because if you add equal quantities of that weak acid and weak base, what you really have in solution is that conjugate base, in this case acetate. So it's a basic solution and the pH should be greater than that. A weak acid with a strong base, um, that is the reaction we just looked at, and they're just showing you right here that you could know when you um, reach the end point, when you reach having an equivalent amount of the acid in the base, because if you have an indicator phenol failing, it turns pink um, at the pH of seven. So a strong acid and a weak base, so kind of the opposite of what we had here, weak acid, strong base. Now it's strong acid, weak base. If you look at that, the strong acid um, dissociated in water makes the hydronium cation. The NH3 is a weak base, so we'll leave that as it is as a reactant. When they react with each other, the ammonia pulls the proton off of the hydronium cation, leaving behind water and NH4 plus. So in this case, when you have equal amounts of the strong acid in the weak base, you should have just that conjugate acid in solution, the NH4 plus. So the pH should be less than seven. Um, and this is just a picture. You could use um, an indicator to know that you've reached that endpoint. You've reached the point at which you've added equal quantities of the strong acid in the weak base. So this is weak acid, weak base. And in this situation, it 
um, it's harder to tell what the pH is going to be. So if we have acetic acid with ammonia, it's a weak acid, a weak base. What you end up with is NH4 plus. So the ammonia takes a proton off of the weak acid, leaving behind acetate, the conjugate base of acetic acid. So the net ionic equation is the second reaction. And so you have both a weak acid and a weak base. And so the pH, um, you don't know, but I think you could go back to that salt. Um, what are the acidic and basic properties of salts and go back and compare the Ka and the Kb to see whether the weak acid is a stronger acid than the weak base is a base. So at this point, turn to page 590. So pause your video, turn to page 590 and try problem 15.2. This is one that really goes all the way back to chapter 13. So if we're adding reactions together to end up with an overall reaction, a neutralization reaction, can you figure out what the Kn? So Kn means the equilibrium constant for the neutralization reaction. So in this particular slide, it would be the equilibrium constant for that second reaction. So take a break, come back, and I will be discussing the next topic. So the next topic is also something, if you think back to chapter 13, you're very aware of. And it's really just another way of talking about Le Chatelet's principle. So the common ion effect says the shift in position of an equilibrium on addition of a substance that provides a common ion with one of the ions already involved in the equilibrium. So that's the same thing as Le Chatelet's principle. So if we have this reaction given on this slide, it's the water dissociation of acetic acid. So when we start out, if we just put acetic acid in water, the equilibrium will make H3O plus and acetate in equal concentrations. But you could also have a problem where um, you add some of the acetate. So rather than just starting out with acetic acid, what if we start out with equal quantities? So you can put acetate into solution in the form of sodium acetate. So if we start out with 0.1 molar of both the acetic acid on the reactant side and acetate on the product side, then when we write the equilibrium expression, it won't be x squared, it'll be x times 0.1 plus x, because as the acetic acid reacts forward, you're gonna increase from 0 0.10, not from zero. And so this is really an idea that you should be familiar with from chapter 13. So when we look at this problem, the math they do is to recognize that it's not gonna react too much forward or backwards, so the X is about equal to the Ka value if you put in equal quantities of the acid in the conjugate base. And so the pH in this case would be equal to 4.74. The common ion effect is just showing you that on the left-hand side, when you have acid, or acetic acid and sodium acetate, the pH is 4.74. And when on the other side, you have simply acetic acid, the pH is very different. So when you have an indicator in there, methyl orange, the color changes from yellow to red if you have the common ion effect. So the common ion effect is really Le Chatelet's principle. So the addition of acetate ion to a solution of acetic acid suppresses this dissociation. The equilibrium shifts back to, react, or, yeah, to reactants. So that makes sense. That's exactly what Le Chatelet's principle would say. If you add some of the product, you're gonna force the reaction to go back to reactants. And this is just showing you that in a visual way, the more acetate you add, the lower the H3O plus concentration is. So the more of the H3O plus will react backwards as you add more acetate. So just in a graphical sense, you can um, visualize that. So a buffer solution is very, very important to ecology, to biochemistry, um, to geology. It's just a really, really important concept. So it's a solution that contains a weak acid in its conjugate base. And we'll see that that chemistry allows that solution to resist 
drastic changes in pH. So it could be something like acetic acid plus acetate, HF plus F minus, NH4 plus plus NH3. So any weak acid in conjugate base can't be a strong acid, strong base, and it can't be a weak acid and some other weak base that's not its conjugate. So this is just showing you if we make a substitution with acetic acid, and after we add OH minus, what the buffer allows to happen is if you add OH minus, which you would think would change the pH a lot, because you have the acetic acid in there, it's going to react to form some more of the conjugate base. If you add a strong acid, H3O plus, the base is going to react in a um, neutralization reaction to make more of the weak acid. And because of that, you're going to buffer some of that um, pH change. And this is just a visual of that same concept. And this is just a visual showing that the pH doesn't change that much, so the color doesn't change if you have a buffer versus if you just have a solution. So um, in the far left, you have pure strong acid. You add a little bit of strong base. The pH changes significantly. In the next case, you have a buffer of acetic acid and sodium acetate. You add a little bit of sodium hydroxide in the last picture, and the pH change stays about the same. The color doesn't change for your indicator. So one really easy way to figure out the pH when you're making a solution is to just rearrange essentially the Ka expression. So if we start out with the Ka, we know that equilibrium expression would be the concentration of hydronium cation times the base divided by the concentration of the acid. If we want to figure out the pH of the solution, depending on the acid-base concentration, we rearrange and pull the H3O plus to the left and the Ka and everything else to the right. And then when we look at that, if we take the negative log of each side, then we get pH on the left side and we get pKa and the negative log of acid over base ends up being the positive log of base over acid. Because remember, um, log of, 1 over x equals negative log of x. Those relationships are in the back of your book. So this equation is called the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So it allows you to determine the pH of a solution. If you know the Ka of the weak acid, and you know how much of the weak base and the weak acid you put into your solution. Oops. And right there, I will let you take a break. So go back to page 593 and do problem 15.4. That's the common ion effect. And then after you do that one, go to page 597 and do problem 15.7, which is on buffers, which a buffer essentially is a common ion effect problem. So the next thing we're gonna talk about are titration curves. So titration, looking at the titration of a weak acid, strong acid, weak acid, weak base, any of those, um, and monitoring the pH, you can learn a lot about the properties of that acid or the base. So it's a procedure for determining the concentration of a solution by allowing a carefully measured volume to react with the solution of another substance whose concentration is known. The equivalence point is the point at which stoichiometrically equivalent quantities of the acid and base have been mixed. So. So the way you would carry this out is, for example, if you have um, sodium hydroxide in the beaker, you would have HCl in the barrette. And as you add the HCl, you would monitor the pH and you could make a graph of that. You'll see for this strong, strong situation where it's a strong acid and a strong base, at the equivalence point, the pH equals seven. 
So that's the point at which we've added equal amounts of H3O plus and OH minus. So we have pure water, so the pH should be seven. So we'll look at more titration curves like this. So this would allow you to figure out something um, about, in this case, what the concentration of the HCl was. So for a strong acid, strong base titration, whatever the source of the acid, if it's HCl and maybe the base is sodium hydroxide, they're completely dissociated in water. So we really have the hydronium cation and sodium, or the hydroxide anion. And we say that reaction goes 100% to completion because it's strong, strong, makes all water. And so before the addition of any sodium hydroxide, the pH is simply going to be the concentration of HCl and then take the negative log of that to get the pH. Um, so, and then after you add some before the equivalence point, you're just going to determine how much excess strong acid you have. So each of these I'm going to talk through, but I will for sure work a problem of each type because it takes, this is probably one of those parts of Chem 108 where it takes a lot of thinking carefully about what your system is and then before and after equivalence point you calculate the pH in different ways. So I'll talk through this and then I'll for sure work some of these problems in my examples. At the equivalence point where they're equal, as we said earlier, that means what you really just have is pure water, so the pH is seven. You get beyond the equivalence point, you've added more OH minus than H3O plus, and so the pH depends on how much excess OH minus you've added. Um, these are just some sample data sets that you could graph. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, you could do these calculations yourself too. This would be just another problem essentially. So the only other type of titration problem we're going to worry about are weak acids with strong bases. So something like acetic acid, which stays together with sodium hydroxide, which is dissociated. And we'll find that they're going to have an equivalence point with a different pH. It won't be seven. And it's slightly different how we calculate the pH at each point. So here are just some different examples of these types of, of curves. The weaker the acid, the less drastic that equivalence point pH change is. Um, so with this type, they don't even talk through in this PowerPoint how you do the calculations, but I will do a strong, strong acid base, and I will do a weak acid, strong base example for you in my problems that I do after this lecture. We will skip the weak base, strong acid. The concept is the same as weak acid, strong base. Um, so I don't think it's that necessary to do both and it just kind of starts to clutter your mind because there are so many things to remember. So this is working through how you would calculate that, but I just said we're skipping it. We'll also skip polyprotic acids with strong bases. It's nice to know though, when you look at this graph, if you have more than one acidic proton, you're gonna have more than one equivalence point. So you'll have an equivalence point when the first proton comes off completely, and then another one when the second one does. We are gonna just talk about solubility. Solubility is pretty important. Um, it's important in all sorts of places, everything from what's soluble in your blood to why your teeth decay, um, to what dissolves in lakes and what's the chemistry of acid rain. So solubility equilibrium is super important. When you look at this slide, what you notice right away is you could have written a K for a solid dissolving in water um, back in chapter 13. We're gonna call it a KSP, a solubility product, rather than a K just to specify that it's for a certain example of chemistry. But you write it the same way, products over reactants. The reactant is a solid, so it's left out. So in this case, the calcium fluoride KSP would be calcium times fluoride squared. 
Um, and this just shows you that clearly, however many cations and anions you have in the um, dissolving process, those are always going to be your exponents. Uh, measuring KSP and calculating the solubility product. So if the concentrations of calcium and fluoride in the standard solution of calcium fluoride are known, KSP can be calculated. So in this one, it says that the calcium is 2 times 10 to the minus 4. The fluoride is 4.1 times 10 to the minus 4. You put those into the expression. You can determine that the KSP is 3.4 times 10 to the minus 11, just like you'd calculate the value for any um, equilibrium constant. Here are a few KSP values. Some things like aluminum hydroxide are barely soluble at all, 10 to the minus 33. Other things like lead chloride, lead 2 chloride, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5, so much more soluble. So there's a whole table of these in the back of your book. So as you work problems, if you need KSPs for other um, compounds, you'll find a huge table at the back of your book. Okay, so this is a similar idea. So if we have magnesium fluoride, Every time one magnesium fluoride dissolves, we get one magnesium two plus, and you get two fluoride anions. So if we want to know the molar solubility, we will take the KSB P, was it on this slide? No. So they must have gotten it from the back of the book. So take the KSP and solve for X. So now the concentration of magnesium is X. The concentration of fluoride is 2x, and it seems redundant, but the concentration of fluoride is 2x, so you have to square that within your expression. So you can solve that easily and come up with um, x equals 2.6 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. That's the molar solubility, because if you think about it, when a mole of magnesium fluoride dissolves, you get a mole of magnesium 2 plus. So the molar solubility is equal, in this case, to the magnesium plus concentration. So with the common ion effect, just like with um, acids and bases, it's just Le Chatelet's principle. So let's try, say we try to dissolve magnesium fluoride in a solution that already has a bunch of fluoride. So sodium fluoride is very soluble, and it wouldn't have a KSP in your table. That's one way you would know that. You'd also know it um, from the solubility rules from chapter four in Chem 107, which I would give you on the test, where it tells you that all sodium compounds are soluble. So if I say I have a 0 0.10 molar solution of sodium fluoride, and it's completely soluble, that means I've made a 0 0.10 molar solution of fluoride. So now if we want to calculate the molar solubility, will it go up or down? we should predict it should go down because the Chatelet's principle says we put a bunch of product in, so the reactant is going to go backwards. So we'll solve exactly the same way. We have a KSP. X is the magnesium 2 plus concentration, which is also the molar solubility. The fluoride concentration is what we've put into the solution, 0 0.10 plus 2X, and that whole quantity has to be squared. So we get a molar solubility of 7.4 times 10 to the minus 9. And it is true, that's far less than it was when we tried to dissolve magnesium fluoride in pure water. Then the molar solubility was 2.6 times 10 to the minus 4. Yeah, so this is just a slide saying exactly what I just said. Why does the solubility decrease in the presence of a common ion? It's just Le Chatelet's principle. Add some product and you're going to force the reaction to go the opposite way. Um, and this is just showing you that in a visual, the solubility of magnesium fluoride decreases as you add more sodium fluoride. So you're adding more product for this solubility reaction, so you're forcing the reaction backwards. Solubility and the pH of the solution. So this too is something that when you think about it is something you could have done in chapter 13. So if we dissolve calcium carbonate in acid, the um, carbonate reacts with the hydrogen on the hydronium ion. 
And so you get calcium two plus plus HCO three minus. So because of that reaction, that means that calcium carbonate solubility increases as you add H3O plus because it, as it dissolves, you take out the um, carbonate and make it into HCO3 minus, which is bicarbonate. Another thing that impacts solubility, before we do this one, I want you to do a couple problems. So just on the KSP idea itself. So on page 612, there's a problem 15.20, so problem 20. And on page 615, there's a problem 21. So just take a break, pause the video, try those two problems and make sure you're understanding. Come back and we'll talk about complex formation. So if we think about um, the solubility of some silver complex, for example, if when it dissolves, the silver cation goes on to form a complex, in this case with ammonia, then what happens is you're pulling product out of solution with a reaction. So we will um, look at that. So this is just showing you that you can calculate the KF because if you add the two reactions together, then to get the final reaction, then the KF should be the product of those two. So KF should be the product of those two expressions and a bunch of stuff will cancel. And so the KF for that particular complex formation is 1.7 times 10 to the seventh. So um, this is just showing the solubility and the formation of that complex. And so, yeah, they should make it more clear they're talking about the solubility. So if, if the source of the silver is silver chloride dissolving on the left-hand side, then as silver chloride dissolves, you get silver plus and chloride. If the silver goes on, as it shows you in the picture on the right, to form a complex with ammonia, then you're pulling that silver out of solution and you're increasing the solubility of the silver chloride. So this is showing you that as you add ammonia, the solubility of silver chloride increases because as the silver chloride dissolves, it forms a complex with NH3, then you're pulling silver out of solution and forcing the reaction to go forward. Um, this is talking about compounds in strange situations where their solubility can increase both in strong acid and strong base. And this is just showing you the unique nature of that. So um, for example, when you look at this situation, I don't expect you to know every complex it forms. I would tell you a complex forms with this. Um, so what, how does it change this solubility? Same thing here. This is just a unique situation. So I would tell you this, as aluminum hydroxide dissolves, if it dissolves in the presence of hydronium, when the OH minus comes off, it'll react with the hydronium, with the acid. And so you'll get water. And so that will increase the solubility because as aluminum hydroxide dissolves, the hydroxide's pulled out of the solution by the acid, therefore making the alumina, aluminum hydroxide um, more soluble. The way it happens in base is by complex formation. So with the aluminum hydroxide, if you dissolve it in the presence of OH minus, the aluminum hydroxide complex that's shown on the right-hand side is still a soluble um, anion. And so in base, it dissolves because um, of that complex formation. And this is And this is showing you kind of what that looks like, that depending on the pH, it'll be more soluble at really low pH and at really high pH, and um, very, very small at middle pHs. So take another break and go to page 622.
On 622, there's a problem dealing with this complex formation. So it's problem 27. So try that problem and then come back and we'll talk about ion products. So an ion product is really a Q. So if something like calcium fluoride dissolves, you get calcium two plus and fluoride, two fluoride anions. And so when the solution is saturated, you'll have those concentrations of cations and anions so that they're equal to the KSP. Well, what would happen if we mix together two solutions that had some soluble calcium and some soluble fluoride? Well, if you went above the value of the KSP, then you'd form a precipitate. So the QC here is really um, what we're talking about, but they call it an ion product. Um, but the point is, is if you add more or a higher concentration of calcium and fluoride, then fits into the expression and equals the KSP, then the reaction will go backwards and you'll have a precipitate. So um, IP is greater than KSP. The solution supersaturated precipitation will occur. So if you compare this to our rules back in chapter 13 for how a QC compares, they're exactly the same. They would say the reaction goes backwards in the first one. They're equal to each other. Everything's fine. It'll stay in solution. If IP is less than KSP, the solution is unsaturated and precipitation will not occur. So you will not have gone to the point where the solution has all it can handle of those um, ions. So um, separation of ions by selective precipitation. So this is a unique situation where we have a metal sulfide and in the presence of acid, when it dissolves, the acid reacts with the sulfide and makes H2, or yeah, H2S. And so it's called the KSP, the solubility of a metal sulfide in the presence of acid. So solubility product in the presence of acid. And this just shows you how you would write the expression based on the reaction. And then you can ask the question, do I have more in solution than um, the solution can handle? And if that's true, then some of it will precip precipitate. We're not going to really focus on qualitative analysis, but it should make sense to you that um, you can separate ions by selectively precipitating out things with different solubility, which is a common lab in Gen Chem 2. We're not going to do a lab like that. So you don't have to worry about this slide. Um, this is just another one showing that, that if you have um, lead and potassium and chromate and chloride, if you mix those together, the lead will precipitate out with the dichromate and the potassium and the chloride will stay in solution. So that would be a way of separating those two um, ions from each other. And this is another one on qualitative analysis, which we're definitely not going to do. Um, but you may have done this in high school. It's called the flame test. If you put some of your liquid into a flame, if it has ions dissolved in it, if you look, if you think way back to chapter, I think it's chapter five in Chem 107, where you talk about atomic structure, all atoms give off different colored light. So this is just taking advantage of that to determine, is there sodium in my solution? Is there potassium? Based on what color of light comes off when I excite the electrons within those um, anions and cations. So I will do a problem on this idea of selective precipitation and using a KSPA, because that's a little bit confusing. Other than that, I want you to go to page 625 and try problem 31, where you use an ion product and um, try the ones I've given you out of the chapter. And I'll come back and do the titration ones and some of these more complicated ones like this thing using a KSPA. So that is all for chapter 15 today.